doing one more video as a follow-up for the January 2014 NFL Public Forum topic. This time, going to be taking a slightly different look at it. If you've already done some research on the topic, you might not get too much out of this video. If your high school offers an African Studies class, you might not get too much out of this video. If you've already debated at Laird Lewis or one of the other January tournaments, you might not get too much out of this video. This one is intended more for people who are new to the topic, who are debating in middle school, who aren't fortunate enough to go to a high school that teaches much about African history except how it affected Europe and America, or just anybody else who is confused by the topic, new to the topic, and not sure what exactly they want to focus on to win the rounds. So, this isn't going to be a crash course in a lot of facts about the region or its history. There's a lot worth learning about. It's an area of the world where there's millions of life or death decisions that affect millions of people that are made every year, and that is certainly worth further study into. But when you have a week or two for a topic, there are some things you have to prioritize to have a winnable case for a tournament. And in those cases, getting dragged into debates on minutiae about individual countries within the region can be counterproductive. I certainly encourage everyone, experienced or inexperienced, to try and learn some more about the Sahel on your own time after you stop debating the topic. None of these issues vanish after they stop becoming public forum topics, and this is one that will certainly be very important over at least the next decade. So, with that said, here are some things that you want to prioritize in the context of a competitive debate topic. First off, figuring out who the likely providers of both kinds of assistance and aid would be. Development assistance is a pr very particular term. There's only a few organizations that are in the business of providing development assistance. That doesn't mean that you can't have things that assist development happen from other groups, but it does mean that you want to know who exactly is talking about this because they're the ones who will write the evidence that you want to use on this topic if you are pro. Generally speaking, looking at things like the World Trade Organization, the World Bank, the International Monetary Foundation, and of course the OECD, who had some involvement with this topic, which is not really quite clear or talk about that more in the main topic video. All of these organizations do have some flaws with their approaches to it, either in terms of how they want to manage the countries in the Sahel, or whether the goals actually have the actual people who they will impact best interests in mind. Generally speaking, this is going to be a debate about neoliberalism, this is going to be a debate about managerialism, this is going to be a debate about neocolonialism. There are a lot of other terms you'll see come up as you look at this. Without getting into too much depth, the main issue here that PRO has to overcome is that many of these countries are trying to develop them in a way that doesn't develop them too much, but just enough to be a good place for factories, a good place for sweatshops, a good place to boost their own economies without actually ever developing into economic equals. And that's a very common criticism that you will have to deal with on the PRO side. There are two ways to deal with this, going around it or going through it. Going around it would be talking about how the topic doesn't say who the assistant should come from or that it has to come from any of these groups. It could come from other group, it could come from other African countries, and that the assistance itself is not the problem, the strings attached are, and we don't need to defend the strings that are attached. That's going around. The benefit is it means you have to defend less. The drawback is it creates less clash and it sometimes looks to a judge as though you are avoiding debate if that is your only response. Going through is just answering directly, explaining why this oversight has more benefits than harms. Why even if there are harms to these systems, they are outweighed by the harms of starvation or the harms of poverty that you will run into without this assistance. If you are con and you are talking about this, then it's going to be important 
to clarify that humanitarian aid is not development assistance. Building infrastructure is not the same thing as bringing in malaria nets, providing vaccinations, so on and so forth. So the second thing that Com wants to do on this issue is talk a lot about just past track records, how they've worked out, how very often these encourage countries to lower regulations in ways that sacrifice their young workforce, sacrifice their environment, sacrifice their long-term economy in exchange for benefiting the foreign companies which choose to build or invest there. You will get roads that go from the sweatshop to the oil rigs to the port, but you're not going to get roads that go to the schools or to any hospital as a hospital is making some other company a lot of money. And that's generally the direction Khan wants to push with this, and it's certainly a winnable argument for either side. The second big argument is just a question of stability. And without getting drawn into individual conflicts, this is probably at the core of the topic of prioritization. The real question is how unstable is the Sahel, and how does that interact with development assistance? Because military aid could be a precondition for it. If Khan is able to win that the area is unstable enough, that development assistance won't actually work, then military aid becomes a priority if, and only if, the military aid is going to work, is going to stabilize the region, and is going to enable development assistance. If all of those aren't true, then it's still hard for Khan to win that argument. Generally speaking, there's two ways that Khan can take this argument and expand on it. The first way is by saying that prioritize means which happens first, not which happens more. So even if an area could benefit more from development than it could from military assistance, then if we need to do one before the other, that's the priority. So that's kind of more of a framing argument. The second way is by talking about how military assistance is actually going to be much more definite. It's what a lot of people in these countries' governments, if not the country's overall populations, say the countries need. It's what prevents larger scale military intervention in the long term. Maybe it's better to train a country's military and to provide them with resources than it is to have to invade and use airstrikes later on, the key example being France and Mali. Aside from that, Pro answers this in one of two ways. The first is, again, the definition debate. They can say that prioritize means more, or prioritize means across a wider area, rather than prioritize means first. So even if there are some parts of the Sahel that need some kind of military assistance, they don't need it more than the whole Sahel needs development assistance, that the military aid is really an afterthought when you look at the region as a whole. And again, that's kind of more going around. Going through, clashing directly, would be explaining why military assistance may actually be bad, why there aren't necessarily deserving, not targets, but d deserving recipients of it. Why it's not necessarily a given that the government is better than the people they want military assistance against, or why intervening in a conflict that you don't understand the motivations behind both sides of actually makes it worse. Perhaps military assistance actually prolongs conflicts rather than narrowing them down. And again, there's historical examples to be used on both sides. Military assistance in the past has both helped end oppressive regimes or helped prevent groups which wanted to become oppressive regimes from coming into power, but Military assistance has also created things like the Vietnam War, so there's certainly a lot of gray area in between as far as is this military assistance going to be part of the solution or part of the problem. The thing to keep in mind about this, again, is this topic is not about the United States of America. Every other month of the year you get a topic that's about the USA, do not feel the need to make this topic about the USA. The aid does not have to come from the USA, the benefits or harms of either side do not have to help or hurt the USA, 
This topic is about the Sahel region and teams that try and shoehorn it into being about U.S. foreign policy or U.S. interests are not only missing the point, but they're restricting themselves from certain arguments in ways that put them at a competitive disadvantage. So this isn't as core to the topic as how secure or how stable is Sahel, but it is core to the topic in terms of how much aid, so how much returns can you get from military aid? How much does that actually help? Does more resources for more guns, for more troops, make the region more stable, or is it a blank check to encourage more conflict? And that's the way the pro wants to approach that question. The way the con wants to approach that question is, what will military aid actually enable? What will it allow? Will it let people actually build local businesses? Will it let people actually choose to risk irrigating and farming an area without being worried that it's going to be overrun by a hostile militia? Will it allow people to actually build up businesses, share wealth, in a way that they're not worried it'll be constantly taken away by war? Or, as Pro would say, is more military assistance, more military aid just going to mean that this all gets undone eventually as you fuel conflict rather than prevent conflict? This means that teams are probably going to want to be more specific about what kind of military aid, more so than what kind of development assistance. Because if I am pro, I want to talk about military aid mainly in terms of direct troops, military hardware, that kind of support. If I am con, and I want to cast military assistance in a more positive light in terms of how it will interact with the countries rather than being a blank check, I might talk about how training troops to lower casualties, to be more sensitive to different situations, to avoid atrocities, to respect the rule of law, might be a positive thing, and how that training can come from the African Union, can come from other African countries, or can come from other third parties, but that doesn't have to be the normal story of intervention by armed force democracy building by drone, whatever you want to call it, but how this can actually be a situation that avoids a lot of the offense that the other team would normally get against U.S. military intervention rather than actor agnostic military aid training, funding, what have you. Generally speaking, a pro case is probably going to be a mix of offense and defense. It's going to have some reasons in the first speech why development assistance is necessary and some reasons why military aid is bad. The con case doesn't have to do the same thing. The con case doesn't have to show that development assistance is bad. All it needs to do is show that military assist, sorry, military aid is as good, or that development assistance is good, but that it is better if it comes after military aid rather than instead of military aid. And if Khan can show either of those things, because they don't have to prove reverse prioritization, that can set them ahead in the debate. So keep that in mind when you are writing your Khan cases. Obviously, there are other options for both sides, and talk about those a little bit more in the other video, but if I'm keeping it basic, the pro case is going to be, here are the good things that development assistance does for the region, here are the bad things that military aid can cause, here are why the region as a whole benefits more from this, but only a few countries would stand to benefit from that, and the harms of that are much worse than the benefits of it, and even the benefits of it don't come close to the benefits of this, so we should try this first. On the other hand, the con case is probably going to look like not so much here is why development is bad. The Sahel should not develop is going to be a very rare con position. A more common con position is going to be that while developing is good, development assistance is often not, it is not as good as it sounds, there are strings attached, there are pressures on the region to develop in a way that benefits the West over themselves, and that even the kinds of development that are good are only possible once the region is stable, once you have enough aid, enough training, 
to allow these countries to govern efficiently in a way that lets them engage with other countries on their own terms rather than letting military threats in these countries grow until someone else feels the need for military intervention instead of military aid. That military aid now stops military intervention in the future. So that's a fairly common way to build a con case. Definitions aren't terribly important on this topic compared to on the topic before it and the topic that's coming up after it. Generally speaking, if you are new to this topic, if all of your points can function under your opponent's definitions, you don't really need to argue them. There's a lot of different countries that can be part of the Sahel. If all the countries that you talk about fit under their definition, it's probably not worth arguing against it. The only definitions that are really worth arguing are what prioritized actually means, because that's how you weigh arguments, and what actually counts as development assistance in terms of is humanitarian aid development assistance or is only controlled loans to incentivize foreign direct investment in exchange for a certain regulatory concessions economic development and there's certainly middle ground in between those but you want to make sure the definition that is being used is one that allows your points to fall under that if not explain that your points are what the debate should be about and that's why your definition is good if so, just you don't need to argue that definition either. But the only place where it becomes a huge issue isn't arguing, for instance, whether or not a small country, which is largely river but is geographically in the middle of the Sahel, should count as the Sahel or not, despite its different climate, because of its latitude. It probably doesn't matter. There's a lot more that goes into the debate than just that one country anyway. If somebody else is focusing the debate on just one country, it's fine to say we're talking about the region as a whole, even if they win this argument, we'll still win the debate because we outweigh with all the other countries. So you have plenty of options aside from engaging in definition debates, and you should only do that if their definition would make one of your main contentions that you think is important to the debate not count. This also means that when you are writing your case and you're thinking about what contentions you want to run, you are thinking about your preemptive answers to definition debates. If their definition doesn't allow one of your points, and your point is something that you, after research on the topic, think is very important to discuss, think needs to be mentioned, and their definition doesn't allow that to be part of the topic, that is the reason their definition is bad. If you haven't actually thought about why your points matter to the topic, or why teams who are thinking about the topic seriously need to consider this, then you won't be able to do that, and you'll get dragged into the minutiae of definition debates. Well, my definition is from a newer source, well, my definition is more primary, well, your definition is out of context, all of that. That can be important sometimes, but it's not as important here. Hopefully, that gives people who are new to the topic some idea of what common cases will look like, what the three big areas of clash are going to be, and what is and isn't important to prioritize. Again, I want to emphasize it is certainly something that is worth continuing to learn about after the topic ends. There is a lot worth talking about with this region and with the issues that extend beyond this region. Development assistance and military aid are certainly in conflict in many places around the world outside of the Sahel as well. But for this topic, those are the three big things that you probably want to focus on. Best of luck adapting to a topic that's outside of a lot of schools' early curricula. And as always, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the comments, and I will try and address them between now and whenever your next tournament is. Hope that helps.